Okay, do ecology basics. We're going to focus on global warming and then move into um, how animals and species adapt over time. Uh, so on the first, got to cram this in. We've got 15 minutes. Um, on the first slide here, we've got a uh, branch kind of thinking map or graphic organizer of the science behind global warming. So if you look, we've got the Industrial Revolution, greenhouse effects, CO2, and then greenhouse gases. The greenhouse gases and the greenhouse effects are directly linked because the more gases I have, the more the effect is seen. So if you look at the bottom half of the greenhouse effects picture here, uh, solar radiation is something that our planet does in fact need desperately because the solar radiation actually completes our um, ability to have life here. Without that radiation from the sun, our planet would be really cold and we wouldn't have life that would be here. So the sun's radiation is desperately needed. So where's my little pointer? So on this picture on the top right, we have the sun's radiation coming through. This green area is the greenhouse, or, I'm sorry, the ozone layer that's on top. So most of the uh, warmth, the radiation, is um, absorbed into the surface, but some of it's pushed back out into the into space through infrared radiation, or that red, right before the red in the visible light spectrum. Uh, some of it, though, is trapped in our ozone and creates a warming effect on our planet. So as the sun rays come through our atmosphere and it warms our planet, that part's good. But when part of it gets absorbed back into our ozone, it causes our um, ice caps, the snow on the top of our planet, to melt. Um, if I go back a slide... Most of the planet is made of water, and it absorbs 90% of this solar radiation. However, it reflects a bunch of it back out. So some of the light is reflected back out. Well, if I increase my water absorption, I'm actually going to increase the temperature that the oceans are. And if I go to the next slide, uh, causing... I'm going to skip and go back. Um, if I ra raise the temperature of the water too much, too fast, then I cause these water currents to shut down. If you remember when we uh, talked about convection currents and how warm rises and cold falls. Well, if I shut this down because the cold doesn't fall because it's not cold anymore, then my water currents shut down, which messes up our weather uh, drastically. So let's go back. Uh, two of your vocab words are on this slide. The word source, so like a CO2 source, is something that adds carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. A CO2 sink is something that removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So the next slide, you probably will need to pause it here uh, and make a T-chart, because that's what we did in class, um, with the pictures that are provided and create at least four examples of a source of carbon dioxide and four examples of a sink for carbon dioxide. So we did that slide. Uh, this is another slide here that was taken. Um, a lot of these were taken up at the National Science Museum in Washington, D.C. and the National Aquarium up in Washington, D.C. a couple of summers ago. So this picture shows the Arctic and its average temperatures in the Arctic. Now, most of us would like it to be uh, above freezing. Well, in the Arctic, they need it to be cold because that contains the ice, which keeps our temperatures regulated on our planet. Well, if you look um, right here as it starts, this is the spikes that we start to see. As it comes up, the 1900s are when the Industrial Revolution started, and you see a dip here, but then it just keeps rising and rising and rising and rising. This is all attributed to both a natural cycle that our planet goes through of warming and cooling, because we see it gets cool and then it warms, it gets cool and it warms, it gets cool and then it warms. But this part here after the 80s is part that is, the majority of it has been fallen upon man, that people are the main contributors to our increase in carbon dioxide. So, exhaustible resources, that's your next vocab word, um, 
Let's see, I was able to do this the other day. Where'd it go? Highlighter. This is our word. Exhaustible resources. Um, that's your vocab word. These are fixed, meaning once we run out, we run out. So the more I use today, the less I have available in the future. These ones are uh, naturally found, but we often combine other things to it to make it usable for us. So the big ones are petroleum, that's what this over here is, coal, which we use in barbecue pits and China uses mainly as a warming, a source of heat, and then natural gas. Um, those are the big three. But this petroleum oil over here is actually used to make almost everything we touch. If it's plastic, it's got some kind of petroleum product in it. So we need to try to figure out how to change that. Inexhaustible resources, come up here and highlight. Inexhaustible resources are natural resources that either will never run out or will have a very long shelf life. Um, the big ones that we talk about are tidal, which would be the movement of currents in the ocean. So unless we do something, those ocean currents should be there for the rest of mankind's time. Um, geothermal, this is where a power plant digs holes down into either uh, pockets of really hot springed water or um, they dig it far enough down that they can get close to the mantle and start pulling up uh, heat from there. Uh, wind power, you may have seen some of these. Uh, they're small wind turbines in Addison now. And then uh, solar, solar power panels, these little green, th the little squares here, use the sun's energy and basically do photosynthesis within their little carbon cells. So here's a global warming picture. It's much uh, the same as the one at the beginning of the slides. Uh, this takes everything from how do you travel best without affecting um, the global warming? What can you do in your home to affect global warming uh, with your food even, like buying your food locally? Uh, if you know of a farmer's market, getting your fruits and vegetables there because the less time it takes to travel, the less um, transportation stuff and oil and gas that it uses to get to your home. Uh, using less shopping bags, like bringing your own bag to uh, the grocery store or to Target and not using their plastic bags. Uh, eating less meat, because again, it costs a lot of money to raise a cow to get beef for hamburgers. Um, planting trees, being a catalyst, you talking the talk, you walking the walk, showing people the proper way to live their life to protect our planet. So let's look at some things that are harmful to our planet. The first one is deforestation. Um, these pictures, they hurt, they hurt me inside. They hurt my heart because I see that they dig these um, roads. That's what this picture here is. They've cut this land out to make a road to uh, connect two cities. And while I understand roads need to be made, I just wish they would take better care of the plants that are here. Maybe we relocate the, the plants to another location. But this one's the one that really I don't understand. This is the destruction of a forest habitat um, through burning. Uh, there are satellite pictures of places in Africa where they're burning them. There's so much forest on fire that you can see it from space. So the deforestation is the destruction of animals' habitat. Um, when natural habitats are destroyed, the animals move into our habitats. Uh, you may have heard of like coyotes living in the city. Um, the reason that we have mice and bugs in our house is because we built our house where they used to live. So uh, here you see these little deer that are using a trampoline as a home. Um, this is a whale in like a cove where he probably gets some kind of solace of being safe. Well, he can because there's trash everywhere. So these animals have two options. They can adapt or they're going to die. And if they adapt to their surroundings, they have a better chance of survival. So the underlying theme of the next couple slides is going to be that top part, adapt or die. This is the way of natural selection and mutation. A mutation is neither good nor bad. It is... It depends on what it does to that animal's survival. So it is a change 
uh, it's usually permanent. It's inherited from their um, parents, and it is a change in their gene or chromosome sequence. Uh, if you think about the X-Men, the X-Men to me are a prime example of mutation. There are X-Men that have a mutation that makes them easy to fit into society, but it makes them a better person. And then there's the guys like the Beast. They don't really get to fit in. So their mutation might be looked upon as a bad mutation because it allows, it doesn't allow them to survive in the same manner. Um, adaptation is a change that allows a species to survive in their environment. So let's look at what these two things could be. Uh, natural selection uh, for adaptation, if you look at the top finch in, finches, these are Darwin's finches. They're from the Galapagos Islands. Uh, the first one, his beak is really big, and so he eats big bugs because his beak can easily crush them. Uh, the next couple, they have smaller beaks, and so they would eat little bugs or seeds. So this guy, he eats seeds off of a tree. He eats little bugs off of a cactus. And then this one, if you look at his beak, it's really small and narrow. And he actually has a tongue that comes out that allows him to get nectar out of flowers. Natural selection is uh, an adaptation to a trait that allows that animal's offspring to survive and thrive and reproduce in their environment. So the big one that they push is this uh, natural selection of giraffes. They started off with a very short, condensed neck. These are their ancestors. And then as the trees grew taller, their necks, in order to survive, had to grow taller. So the pepper moth is one that we cover in notes because it's often covered in the test. Um, at the turn, the start of the Industrial Revolution, the pepper moths were all a light-colored gray. Well, the atmosphere uh, turned the trees from that light gray that you see in the upper right-hand corner to the darker gray. The birds that were able to see the moths, usually the dark ones because they stood out, on that light tree were picked off. Um, and then on the darker tree bark, the light pepper moths were picked off because they're easy to see. So this genetic mutation that turned some of the dark moths gray uh, became a beneficial mark for them because they, the ones that learned to go, the dark ones that learned to go to the dark wood were able to survive. And the light ones that stayed on the light tree were able to survive. So they both exist today. Uh, they just live in the trees that allow them to survive the best. These are bugs from the museum up in Washington, D.C. The screen on the left, the side on the left, is a dark sand, and so they're dark bugs that live there. And then on the right, they're light sand, and there's light bugs that live there. Those are exactly the same bug. They're no different, just their shell, their exoskeleton is a little different. So in these two pictures, um, this was one of your exit cards that you were supposed to post to the web. You've got two pictures. You've got the bunny on the left and the bunny on the right. So which of these rabbits do you think lived in the desert? And how can you tell? So not just which one. Don't just say left or right or right or left. But if you say the right one, then why do you say the right one? If you say the left one, then why do you say the left one? You have to explain it. Um, this little guy is a type of fox. So when you look at his picture, and I pick him because he's really silly looking, but what are his adaptations for living in the desert? So looking at his whole body, don't just look at his face that's really silly. Look at his whole body and write down at least three things that would allow him to survive in the desert. Hydrothermal vents, we're going to go really fast. Uh, these are a specific type of vent that uh, is super, super hot. It's deep in the ocean, so the water around it is very, very cold. But when it, the water comes out of these vents, uh, there's usually carbon, which is why this is black here. And uh, they, it's really, really hot. So if you look down here, it's 700 degrees Fahrenheit. That's extremely, extremely hot. So here's a picture of the ones that live there. You may have to pause it. This is a Yeti crab. He's really funny looking. And then these giant tube worms that can be up to four feet tall. This is the first known mammal on our planet. It is the oldest carbon dated mammal on our planet. And so I just saw him at the museum and thought he needed to go on our slide. And in the last 30 seconds, two picture or two skeletons. Uh, the one on the left is from Northern Africa and Southern India. And the one on the right, I'm sorry, is from uh, parts of Europe, so very far north. So if you can look, there are two adaptations. Please pay careful attention because we are going to discuss what are their adaptations. I will see you in the hallway and we're done.